now I'm ready. I'm standing in the right place. I've got my mic ready. Um, so a very warm welcome to everybody for um, our Resilience Hub event, um, the Health Climate Nexus uh, and delivering um, a, uh, get the title right, delivering a virtuous cycle of benefits. Um, so the reason that um, we've chosen this topic is we can see more and more how the impact of climate change has um, subsequent health impacts. And in fact, I'm not sure that there are many climate change impacts that don't bring um, an element of health. Uh, and what, what is becoming very evident in the conversation is that the, the healthier society is, the more it's capable of being resilient to the impacts of climate change. And then also, we can see how many synergies there are between responding to um, uh, the climate crisis in terms of improving uh, resilience to climate change and similarly improving resilience to health. So that's the, the reason for our topic. Um, so on the next slide, a very small bit of housekeeping uh, because we'll be taking photographs today. So we just wanted to say if anyone doesn't want their photograph taken, uh, please come and let me know at the end and, and we'll sort that out. So. First, um, I wanted to give you uh, an overview of the program, uh, which is on the next slide, so it's fairly um, ambitious program. We had, this is the, the, the substance of the, com the communication today is all about solutions. And we wanted to bring, not the, the, the why we should be doing things, but the how and um, showcasing where people have are already delivering solutions. And we had so many of those solutions to choose from that we split our program into two. So first, we have some um, policy-driven solutions, uh, and we're also gonna make um, both the, the physical audience and the virtual audience do some work. We have a poll, and we're going to show you the, um, the QR code for that in a minute, a, men a menti poll. Um, so then we'll have a discussion about that, and then we'll move on to another set of speakers uh, on more topic-driven solutions. Uh, so, and then there's a bit of a wrap-up um, discussion about what we found. So, um, I, in terms of outlining um, why Mott McDonald is bringing this to you, um, I wanted to describe what we do. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, our our group purpose uh, unfold before you, uh, but um, for those who don't know us, what we do uh, is we design the, the services and systems that keep society running. So the, the schools, the hospitals, the, um, the roads, the railways, the uh, energy, waste, water systems, digital systems, and also provide some of the, um, the insight on environmental, social, and economic outcomes that help um, uh, municipalities and uh, our clients make make decisions on these topics so as you can see we're very much into the interconnected nature uh, of um, of these systems and how they improve societal outcomes so hence I'm really proud to work for a company uh, who all, albeit has an engineering backbone but is all about um, improving outcomes uh, for the the people who use these systems uh, so, um, thinking about this nature of interconnectedness, I put on the, the next slide a quote that I feel is really powerful. So I'll read it out. Um, if the pandemic has a lesson, uh, it is this, everything is connected. There's no economy without health, no health without science, no science without government, no government without trust, no trust without facts, and no facts without a public commitment to the pursuit of the common good. And I would say also, there's not really um, that uh, basis of common good without a healthy society. So just showing us how um, all of the things that, that we're thinking about um, whilst we're uh, looking at clim climate change have all that interconnected nature. So uh, the next slide then shows the QR code for the poll. And I think uh, for those online as well, that will be in the chat. So take a moment to, um, to go in there and uh, please only answer the first, uh, the first three questions. 
uh, and we'll come back and have a look at uh, what we learned there. But I really want to get on to um, showcasing uh, our speakers today. So we have um, a lineup uh, slide that will just show you. We have two um, physically uh, speaking and two that are um, uh, three that are online. Um, so in a moment, I'll introduce Wisborne and Alice. Then we have Fiona, who um, is on the other side of the world, and it is the middle of the night, so we thank Fiona um, massively. Then we have Sophie Howe, and finally, uh, Irvan Perungram. So um, first off, I will introduce uh, Wisborne and Alice. Um, so um, so it, the kicking off here, um, it's, it's about illustrating the strong link between climate change, uh, health, and livelihoods. So this is a great example uh, of how action between um, central and local actors can improve resilience to the impacts of climate change in Zimbabwe. So Wisbam Malaya is the Secretary General of the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations. So that's ZCIEA, which is a membership-driven organization representing Zimbabwe's informal workers who comprise about 80% of the company's workforce. Wisborne is committed to promoting decent livelihoods while also supporting the health and dignity of all workers in Zimbabwe. And the program that... Um, uh, Wisborne is going to be talking about has been supported by the Institute for Environment and Development, the IIED. So we also have Alice Fer Sferdlik on the line. Um, so hopefully there'll be a chance to bring Alice into the conversation uh, when we get to the questions. And uh, we will make sure that we f flash up Alice at some point so you can see that she's, she's out there uh, in the ether. So Alice is a researcher at the International uh, Institute for uh, Environment and Development. She has interests in health, city planning, and informality. She's partnered with ZCIEA to analyze the climate and health-related risks facing informal workers in Zimbabwe. So uh, enough from me, because you really want to hear from uh, the speakers. So over to Wisborne. Thank you very much, Kalase. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. As my name has been introduced already. Uh, quickly, I'm going to step into the work uh, which we have done with the support from the Institute, uh, International Institute for Environment Development, IID, and we partnered the Training and Research Support Center in Zimbabwe, as well as Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions and our organization, Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Association. Basically, uh, this research was targeting at um, an, an analyzing and understanding the operations which are within the informal settlements, the informal economy, and uh, how they might as well as the effects on climate as they operate. And uh, within the research we did, we targeted uh, two key areas of the country, two key provinces, Harare province and Masungo province, where in Harare we targeted two areas, one which is like a swamp area, which was identified after the effects of Operation Muramba China in uh, 2005. And this was, this place is called Caledonia, and we also had Mavugutafara as well as Hopli. Then in Mashingo, we targeted the area called Mucheke and Rujeko. What we identified in these areas is both areas, the people who are operating in the informal economy, they are trying to earn a living through various activities of even the waste, which is uh, put in the communities. They take the waste and they recycle. But at the same time, they were facing challenges which were supposed to be attended to by their local authorities. One key issue is water. Uh, there is a challenge of water, and people were resolving to other ways of uh, fetching for water, which resulted in them fetching water from unprotected wells. I can give an example of one of the areas in Harare, uh, um, Hopley Farm, where some were even ending up 
fetching water in a well which is in a grave site. This is how, how bad the situation was. But we also identified that in the, in the same space, it was a very organized system of operation where some people would throw away uh, their products or materials as garbage, and other ones who collected them for recycling. We have seen a situation where people have uh, managed to put up some, uh, to, to mend some bags uh, out of plastics, which was thrown by others, and they recycled some, they pick up cane, some they also pick up some uh, plastic gadget, electronic gadgets, and they separate the copper and so forth, and they go and resell to earn a living. We also identified, for example, in Masingo, that there was a high level for harassment of informal workers by the authorities because they deemed all the operations which were happening there, like for example, them doing agriculture um, within the uh, side, roadsides and uh, in the urban communities. And according to the bylaws there, it's not allowed and those people would be criminalized. At the end of this research, the key stakeholders in particular in Masingo, where the community highlighted the challenges they were facing, one of them key that the local authorities were not providing proper service delivery of collecting garbage and providing them clean water, as well as not uh, the, uh, not also providing them with the uh, uh, electricity, which is energy. Then the community also gave proposals to the local authority, which the local authority came on board and accepted as many of the proposals, one of them being that the local authority who combine efforts with the a community and start to plant trees annually, which is part of resuscitating the environment. The local authority also committed that they will improve the issue of them collecting garbage in the community and set up what we call the champions team, where local authority members, the community members and other key stakeholders are part of that champions committee and they would meet regularly to assess where everyone is playing their role to make sure their environment is safe and better. The in other important key point I may need to highlight is, as a result of the research, we also managed to sign a memorandum of understanding with the city of Masingo, where we came up with some recommendations to be addressed. And these recommendations, they are more for the benefit of the community members as well as the local authorities to put harmony in that area. As I speak, we have already started the engagements on the recommendations where there is an agreement to make sure the local authority will provide the space for people to start to uh, operate in, in a habitable way promoting the green economy as far as in a way to try and preserve the environment. In Harad, but the community members have already committed to make sure they will comply to regular operations as required by the authorities as long as they are provided with water and uh, the garbage is collected on time for them to make sure they are safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wisborne. And one of the things that um, Wisborne told me was the trust between um, the local actors from the, the workers and the municipalities, which was re really important in this work. So moving on quickly. Um, so now from the other side of the world, um, a nation that's already recognized the link between climate change and health and sees the opportunity to create guidelines for action I'd like to introduce Fiona Armstrong, um, who is founder and executive director of the Climate and Health Alliance, um, whose mission is to build powerful health sector movement for climate action. Um, and one of the things I, uh, what we did to, to create um, uh, a good environment here was I asked people fun facts. Uh, to say about themselves. So uh, we didn't manage to get any for, for Wisborne and Alice, but um, Fiona tells me that she once asked the Prince of Wales to pass on a message to the then Prime Minister of Australia, Tony Abbott, to step up Australia's commitment to climate action. 
So uh, over to Fiona, thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Well, you never want to miss an opportunity like that to um, ask a favour of the, the Prince of Wales. Um, welcome, everybody, and thanks so much for the opportunity to join this event tonight. Um, I want to, or well, tonight, as it is here, your afternoon, I think, in Glasgow, um, as I begin, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which, from which I'm speaking tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and acknowledge that sovereignty of this land was never ceded, and pay my respects to traditional owners and Indigenous people across the world, and acknowledge ongoing injustices with respect to stolen land. Um, so I've been asked to talk um, briefly about climate adaptation and resilience in Australia. Um, many of you would know that the level of warming that we are already experiencing and will experience in coming decades requires adaptation, particularly for those who are experiencing climate change um, impacts worst and first. Um, people who are elderly, people who are living in the tropics, Australia's first people who are living on country, um, particularly in northern Australia, people with comorbidities. So um, in the health set, in the health field, you know, we're referring to people who've got multiple different conditions that exacerbate their experience of um, conditions like um, heat waves, people with um, conditions like multiple sclerosis. Um, people who take many different medications, all, all vulnerable. Um, so to the response, my organisation, the Climate and Health Alliance, was involved in developing the Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Adaptation Plan for the state of Queensland in 2018. And I want to commend the Queensland Government for their leadership. This was the first climate adaptation plan um, focused on health developed for an Australian jurisdiction. And as we travelled around, we, I work, we worked with colleagues from the National Centre for Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility. And as we travelled around the state, um, asking health and social sector stakeholders what they wanted in an adaptation plan, um, we heard that they were faced with multiple climate change adaptation strategies, but lacked policy guidance, as well as the capacity and the resources that they needed to respond. What we did hear was that was a very strong appetite to build climate resilience in the health sector um, to ensure service quality and continuity. So recognising that a failure to adapt would risk the safety and quality of care. Um, and there was really a clear emphasis on the need for stakeholder engagement. People wanted to be involved in developing solutions and they wanted to, um, to be involved in collaborative networks to guide and support action. We heard about some of the challenges, there were risks to supply chains, about people being displaced from homes and from country, and there was a lack of leadership and financing and governance. Um, and, and um, associated challenges of rising energy and insurance costs. We also heard about a lack of information to guide decision making um, and that this was leading to a sense of helplessness in the community, in the sector and in the workforce, uh, compounded by a siloed approach to policy and practice that was limiting the effectiveness of actions. So what stakeholders wanted um, in the plan, um, and you might get a sense of where I'm heading, collaboration was a really strong key. People wanted the opportunity to work in a sort of systems approach and to work with um, people from different sectors uh, and from different disciplines to bring a systemic approach um, approach to tackling these challenges. There was really strong interest in supporting the this, this sector and reducing the sector's own contributions to climate change through um, its carbon emissions and environmental footprint. Um, some of you may not be aware that the healthcare sector globally is responsible for about 4% of global emissions. In Australia, due to our carbon intensive um, energy sector, it's around 7%. Um, however, there was a very strong awareness about the opportunities for significant economic, social, health and environmental benefits associated with climate mitigation and adaptation, 
what people think about and um, as no regrets and win-win options. So the pathways to respond involve making decisions um, and stakeholders want leadership. They want health impact assessments, they want support to do um, risk assessments, and they want funding and resources to build resilience and adaptive capacity. But as I said, they really also want opportunities to collaborate and recognise that engagement and connections builds both emotional and social resilience, but it also supports the emergence of locally relevant responses and empowerment. Um, data and research is very important to underpin adaptation and resilience. And we also heard about the importance of building on the strengths of vulnerable groups. So there was, you know, people were, were at pains to emphasise that those affected worst and first doesn't necessarily aren't by definition weak or without capacity, but it was very clear that people who are vulnerable want their strengths, the, the strengths that they do possess to be acknowledged and built upon rather than being cast as victims, because that's very disempowering. So the plan that we developed was built around 10 priority adaptation measures um, focused on leadership and governance, building the preparedness of the sector to respond, evaluating those specific vulnerabilities, but building um, on strengths, underpinning this all with research and data and evaluation, economics and financing is absolutely critical, setting up structures for collaboration and using education and communication to build skills and capacity, but recognising the underpinning importance um, of policy and regulation that the ser services, the sector and industries want this um, certainty to guide decisions and investment and investing in climate resilient infrastructure, technology and service design were all critical. Um, so I would finish by saying that we were very clear in developing this plan that reinforce, mutually reinforcing adaptation and mitigation strategies are critical because no amount of adaptation will protect health if we fail to mitigate. I'll stop there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so again, moving on to... Um, a, to the UK, specifically Wales, where that policy is already in place and is already making changes. Um, so uh, I will invite Sophie Howe to speak. Um, you're going to wonder what the fun fact I'm going to say about you is. <laughs> But just quick introduction, so Sophie is the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Her role is to provide advice to the government and other public bodies in Wales on delivering social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being for current and, most importantly, future generations. A uh, fun fact about Sophie, I like this one, is she is described by The Guardian as the world's first minister of the unborn. Quite a cool, uh, quite a cool description. Not entirely accurate because um, I'm actually an independent commissioner, so I'm not part of um, government. I'm not a minister. My job is to hold the government and um, the other 43 um, institutions, public sector institutions, um, delivering policy and services in Wales to account on how they meet the needs of future generations. So um, Wales is a small and progressive country, um, the only country in the world to have legislated to protect the interests of future generations generations through our Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. I'm not sure um, if, oh, here we are. This is exactly um, the sort of overarching principle contained um, within the Act and the duty um, that falls on our 44 public bodies, including um, the Welsh Government and specifically Welsh Ministers, to demonstrate that they're acting in a manner which seeks to ensure that the needs of the present are met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, why is this um, a solution that I'm proposing? Well, um, if every government in every part of the world did this, we wouldn't all be here um, today talking about a climate catastrophe because um, as far back as the early 1990s when the UN published its first framework of evidence on, on climate change, we knew then, probably not in as much detail as we know now, but we knew then of the problems. Um, 
since Al Gore published his first Inconvenient Truth at around about uh, the same time, we've done more damage um, to the planet um, knowingly since that point. Um, and we've done it because we have discounted the needs and interests of future generations. So what does our act do, other than requiring this sort of um, decision-making in this um, context? If I could have the next... Um, slide, please. It also sets out seven long-term um, well-being goals, and these goals were devised uh, with the people of Wales in a conversation about the Wales, what's the Wales you want to leave behind to your children and your grandchildren. Um, at the same time as our act was being developed, uh, the UN SDGs were going, uh, were going through, so looking to, to, the, to the SDGs and looking to the conversations in Wales, these were the goals um, that, um, that, that made it into our legislation. Again, critically important, this isn't some high-level policy documentation. This is, and um, that can change from one uh, political cycle or one party manifesto to the next. This is set out in law in Wales. And all 44 of our public... ...of those well-being goals. A really important point in itself, particularly around the interconnections. So it's just as much the responsibility of our NHS in Wales to deliver a resilient Wales, a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language, a prosperous Wales, um, a more equal Wales, as it is uh, to deliver on the health of the nation. Why is that so critically important? Well, because we know that the things that make the biggest difference to life expectancy and health are things that are completely, in the main, outside of the healthcare system. So the World Health Organization tells us that in terms of the gaps in life expectancy, and we know that from uh, you know, the global north compared to the global south. We also know that um, back in, uh, back in you know, the UK and in my hometown, there's a 10-year difference in life expectancy from people who live in the leafier suburbs in the north to the poorer suburbs um, in the south. And the things that account for that life expectancy, 35% about income protection and social security, 29% about your living conditions, the quality of your homes, um, do you have access to nature? Are you living in areas of high air pollution? 19%, um, again, which is why this is important that what we're talking about here is the well-being of future generations, not the needs of future generations. Social relationships, community, sense of agency, the softer stuff that has perhaps been forgotten for too long by our, our political um, leaders and by our structures of governance. But that sense of, you know, can you make a difference in your community? Do you have trusted relationships and people you can turn to in your hour of need? 19% of the difference um, to the gaps in life expectancy. And so what are we seeing um, as a result of these um, requirements. I just want to give a mention as well, if I could have the next slide, the principles by which our decisions have to be um, taken. The minister who took this um, piece of legislation through the Senate, the Welsh Parliament, described it as the Common Sense Act. Um, why do we need to legislate for common sense? Sadly, it's because common sense isn't actually that common. Um, and so here we have five ways of working five ways in which decisions must be taken in Wales. So they must be taken considering the long-term impact of those decisions. They must be taken in a way which seeks to prevent problems from occurring or getting worse. They must be taken in a way which is integrated, so this is recognising those connections between all of those seven wellbeing goals. Our organisations must collaborate with each other and with um, citizens, with business, with the voluntary sector and so on, and they must involve citizens. Now, I think if you ask the average person, they would say that's an entirely sensible set of principles for decision making, but very rarely um, do we actually apply these, um, these principles. So what has changed as a result of this? One of the biggest, earliest test cases for the legislation was government plans to spend the entire of Wales' borrowing capacity on a 13-mile uh, stretch of motorway where there was a problem with congestion. My intervention as the independent commissioner holding the government to account on those proposals was, can you explain to me 
how uh, doing that is in line with our goal of a prosperous Wales, which talks about a productive, innovative, low-carbon society, one which uses resources efficiently and proportionately, one which acts on climate change. Um, no, they struggled to do that. Can you explain to me how this is in line with our goal of a healthier Wales? When we have an obesity crisis as one of our key long-term trends, what we actually need to do is to get people out off their backsides, out of their cars, walking, cycling, using public transport, and we need to reduce um, air pollution levels. Can you explain to me how this is in line with the goal of a more equal Wales when 25% of the lowest income families in that region don't even own a car, so you're spending all of that money um, not for their benefit, but for the benefit of those who are arguably already um, better off. The road programme was cancelled. Instead, applying our Future Generations Act, we are now spending 800 million. We'll have six new train stations, um, mass investment in active travel, bus routes, public transport, um, and so on. And it goes further than that. As a result of our legislation, different conversations are starting to emerge. In our capital city, the public health consultant was seconded to the council to lead on the development of the transportation strategy. And when you apply a public health lens to a transport problem, you get a completely different set of solutions. So what the public health consultant did is said, actually, I'm going to target first the areas in Cardiff with the lowest levels of life expectancy and the highest levels of air pollution. Also an equality issue there, socioeconomic. But if you're black, Asian minority ethnic living in the UK, you're more likely to be living in areas of high air pollution, less likely to have access to nature and public open space. So let's target those communities who are living with that air pollution. Let's put in our active travel routes in those communities first so that we can reduce levels of air pollution. Whilst we're doing that, let's clean and green those communities. Let's work with the drainage people and build in sustainable urban drainage so that those communities become green. The concrete jungle that they formerly were in is no longer um, flooding and we have increased um, active travel rates in Cardiff. New data just uh, came out this week. 70%, 78% um, increase in kids travelling to school uh, sustainably since some of these actions have been put in place. I could give you very more, uh, many more details such as the doctors who are planting trees, such as the doctors who can prescribe um, bike hire free of charge instead of statins, um, such as the hospitals who are creating sites for nature on their estate. This is the sort of decision making that happens when you have a governance infrastructure which is long term, which is integrated and which is designed to meet the needs of future generations. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> That's so compelling. And um, somebody said something yesterday that really uh, stayed with me. She said, um, all other species know that their primary purpose is to protect the future of their offspring and, and their species. So just, um, yeah, we're beginning to see the picture here in terms of building up the synergies between, between health and climate resilience. So, um, but I'm sure it looks so different in different parts of the world. So, um, uh, Irvin, over to you, but your quick introduction, including fun fact. Um, so, uh, uh, you are a sustainability researcher and the Jakarta Governor Special Envoy on Climate Change, and one of your major contributions in the field of environmental law development in, Asia, in Indonesia um, is the attestation of Environmental Protection and Management Act. And I learned um, just earlier on that Irvin is a skateboarder. So as a form of active travel, I totally applaud that. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you very much to having me here because I can meet with Sophie. Um, she's the, the commissioner for uh, Future Generation Act. I take my uh, degree at Cardiff and one of my coursework is about Future Generation Act. Thank you very much. So, well, um, speaking about Jakarta, um, we are a mega city in Southeast Asia. Uh, like you said, we have um, problems that we encounter in Global South in terms of um, air pollution. As you know, air pollution and climate change impact is really, really devastating in our um, region. Um, and then Jakarta, we have 10 million people, um, inhabitants, and re Recent research um, from the University of um, Technology of Bandung said 1.6 million people in Jakarta 
impacted by um, air pollution, um, uh, air pollution impact and uh, climate change. That's why um, in the city ja of Jakarta we are um, developing our resilience strategy, facilitating by um, Rockefeller Foundation, where um, we really take, we really do an analysis of urban. Uh, urban system. So we analyzed 10 urban system that being threatened by climate um, by climate change. One of that is um, healthcare and well-being um, of, of others where um, we are not just facing air pollution, heat wave, heat strokes, but also as a city in tropic island, we also have malaria, dengue, in, in rainy, uh, and uh, at rainy season. So what, what we do um, on that is um, we take this resilient strategy um, approach by develop it um, by like including three, um, three vulnerable um, actors, women, children, and the elderly. To, so we can get the insight and get the input from them how to how we can increase and developing our uh, uh, our health system not just to give uh, like not just to increase coverage of, of health care for lower lower uh, income neighborhood but also to give them um, not just money to use after they get the impact, but how we can um, give them the access to better, uh, better uh, lifestyle, lifestyle like parks, um, like um, better uh, air pollution um, uh, system for monitoring and um, for clean, cleaning the, the pollution uh, in Jakarta. So my highlights on this is, we need to work with the, the most vulnerable actors, but also we, we need to develop the policy based on the needs of, of the, the vulnerable um, actors. But also one of the problem that we are facing in Indonesia is we are not really have the collaboration from the uh, business sector at the, at, at the planning stage. So mostly it's about giving corporate social responsibility. So in our resilient strategy, we are um, inviting them to involve at the first hand on the planning uh, stage to help our city to be more res resilient and increasing our um, urban adaptive um, capacity. Thank you, Claire. Excellent, thank you. So, yes. And, and I will make sure we give a round of applause to uh, the people in the virtual space as well before, before we move on. Um, but next, we're going to see how the crowdsourcing of uh, thoughts um, came through on the Mentimeter poll to see what sort of questions that might generate for our speakers. Um, so over to Anna, who I think we will soon see on screen. Um, and in order to be able to see the results, you, <laughs> you'll probably have to, you, I mean, yes, by all means, take those seats to see. So we asked three questions, um, and I'll probably, um, aha. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, there is a policy gap in your city, state, region in relation to addressing the health impacts of climate change. And I wanted to, um, uh, well, let's go on actually to the other two to see um, what we've got from those other questions. So, another one, does your city, state, region have plans to embed long-term societal resilience to the impacts of health and climate change? So, that's good news that um, not not quite half, but um, we know that there is some movement in that. And then the final question, uh, which is one that's um, related to Sophie uh, and the future of well-being, how mature is your city, state or region in the prioritization of the well, uh, well-being of future generations? And again, that's really good news that it's moving on the agenda um, because I was rather expecting that it would uh, be shifted towards the right, but um, uh, there's there's a good sort of moderate, um, so uh, yeah, a good normal distribution there, which is 
fairly pleasing. Um, and hopefully, if we did it again in a year or two's time, we would see a shift. Um, more speaking from Sophie, and we, we'll undoubtedly get there. But um, just in five minutes, I suppose, so my first question would be in relation to that first slide from Fiona. Um, I'm interested to know, so the, the, uh, it's identified that it feels like there is a policy gap. What advice would you give to anyone from, um, I suppose, local government in relation to where to start to, to begin to uh, close that policy gap? Yeah, thanks, Claire. Look, I, th I think the good news is that local government are actually leading in lots of ways. I mean, both in terms of building resilience, but also in mitigation as well. Um, the slide that you have in terms of how many plans exist is roughly reflective of the World Health Organization survey in terms of national climate and health plans. So those are around 50 odd countries have those plans in place. Um, plenty more to do. Um, here in Australia, in local government, there's good work going on in the state of Victoria. We're involved in a project to support local governments in Western Sydney, one of the most um, climate impacted metropolitan areas in Australia to bring climate health considerations into their plans and strategies at the local government level. And I guess the, the good news is that there's lots of places for local government to start, whether it's around um, supporting um, active transport, like um, Sophie said, is so important, you know, getting people out of their cars, but also greening our streets to reduce the um, um, urban heat island effect, but also to improve air quality. Um, it can also be um, um, around, you know, local sort of um, food initiatives. That's a, a, a great way to engage communities in um, strategies that can both uh, reduce emissions and improve our health. Food is a is a is is something that people see as incredibly tangible, and that they feel a sense of agency around, and they can. Um, appreciate the you know real the the immediate benefits associated with that so there is quite a lot going on there's um a lot of strategies i think that local governments are already engaged in that they're not necessarily even thinking about as health and climate change strategies like those ones that i mentioned but they um that the, they're already, you know, taking action on, and um, and once they start to appreciate how um, those can contribute to integrated solutions, hopefully that would can increase their motivation to scale them up. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, so on our um, second result which was about whether um, city, states and regions had plans to embed uh, societal resilience. I'm interested to know um, what you said, Irvin, about um, the fact that uh, the solutions are um, not so much in the, um, the treatment when somebody's got sick, but more in the preventative. And I'm just wondering, um, and, I, and I might ask also Alice, so if, if you d give a quick observation and then we bring Alice in, to whether you feel like the, the, the best place to start that movement is a sort of top-down policy or, or from a, a, a bottom-up in the design of places that comes more sort of uh, naturally. Uh, yeah, uh, Claire, um, I also want to add um, um, ideas on the first question. So there is gap, why? because the mitigation and adaptation context, all the ideas and money is in mitigation side. We don't have anything on adaptation. In Indonesia, for instance, we don't have any adaptation and resilience uh, low banding products. Uh, that's why um, the gaps is there and the funding is not there, um, Claire. So in Jakarta, we are trying to integrate it in one uh, legal binding products um, under the gubernatorial, gubernatorial um, um, uh, instruction where it's 
um, just me, not mention mitigation as strategy, but also adaptation and resilience to ensure we have sufficient fundings um, for um, the action. And I think that's the first in um, Asia, if I'm not mistaken, because no one talk about adaptation because we cannot measure it. It's not like mitigation that we can um, easily measure. The second question, I think, it will need uh, to approach. It will the government the government need a capacity building from the inside, where um, we, uh, where um, um, academia, um, business sector, um, NGO activists need to to capacitate the local government to develop the strategy, implement the um, action, but also we need like. Um, pressure from without, from without, where citizens really exercise their um, access to health and well-being. For example, um, uh, in COVID-19 in Jakarta, they're they're uh, arising on um, bicycle user, and Brontom uh, price is being uh, jet plan um, um, because everyone wants to uh, to to use bicycle. But there is no bicycle line, so uh, they they're, they're insisting to govern uh, the government to uh, develop bicycle line for them. Um, so it's like um, uh, integrating the, the two interests become one implementation. Where Jakarta now have um, more than 200 kilometers of bicycle line, and uh, and finally I would I would like to say that um, COVID-19 also give pressure. Um, not just climate change, because in Jakarta now we experiencing more of um, what we call it violence to women because of work from home, and we are um, getting um, phone calls from our citizen that um, they are in, 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 uh, embracing that. So uh, I think it will be uh, we need to work like uh, local government by facilitating the process and really working with the citizen how we, we, we give them access to uh, healthy and well-being. Claire, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. So um, very quickly, if we could have Alice to see any observations on what uh, you've heard so far. And then um, we're about to do a speaker reshuffle. But And I know Sophie has to go, but if there was time, just a very quick observation from you on that final slide and the normal distribution. So Alice, if we can have you on screen, just so we, um, we can give Thanks. you a wave, because we know you're there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, as Wisborn was saying, we have evidence of innovation in a smaller city in Zimbabwe called Masfingo, where strong civil society partnerships with a responsive local government help to bring change to support health and livelihoods, as well as food security, nurseries um, for tree planting, and ways of working in cross-sectoral ways. I think that's another key aspect that's come out from some of the other speakers. To achieve change on health, it really is important to work across sectors. But especially in the case of Zimbabwe, we see the example of a bottom-up partnership that is equitable and led by community needs, and I think can really achieve multiple transformative benefits that way. So that's one way that we've seen uh, action on the ground um, already translating into meaningful benefits. Thanks. Thank you. And your, your program with Wisdom Born is pretty awesome. So thank you for illustrating that. Um, so Sophie, final comment uh, on the future of uh, the well-being of future generations. So I think that the um, the slide and the um, you know the number of people who are moderately or you know indeed um, uh, to a high degree considering the interests of future generations is encouraging. Um, I think I just counsel a little bit of caution in terms of how that's being done and whether that's being done in an integrated um, way. And it's actually quite difficult um, to do that and unless you have a set of long-term goals that you're actually working towards and sort of you know, um, backcasting from, if you like. So I think that, let me give you an example. If your sole aim is to decarbonize the tran transportation system, because we need to do that in order to tackle climate change and emissions from, um, from, from vehicles, because that's in the interest of future generations, um, investing all your money in electric vehicles and policies around that is probably quite a sensible thing to do. If, however, 
your mission is to reduce transport-related emissions whilst also reducing uh, poverty and making sure that we're not creating a situation where we're making things more unequal for people and creating more cohesive communities and looking after people's um, health, then actually investing in EV is probably not the right answer and your answer is to um, invest in public transport, active travel um, and so on. So. I think the importance here is that set of holistic long-term goals that you must test and use as your metrics to test every um, decision that you take in terms of is it in the interest of future generations in that holistic way rather than that siloed way. Perfect. Thank you. That's a very good place to end halfway through, as in you're, you're not, we're not done yet. Um, so, But I would like um, to thank everybody and give uh, both uh, the people... Um, in the room and our virtual speakers a big round of applause please thank you um okay so a bit of a reshuffle um Irvin, uh, uh there may well be more that you can contribute so please don't go anywhere no uh, I, i'm not good. <laughs> and jad we can welcome you to the stage um so uh now we're going to take um, a slightly different lens on the same uh, the same issue, so um, which is looking at particular health or climate topics like um, air quality or food food security, and seeing how they then can open out into um, a better sort of systemized approach to deliver both climate and health changes uh, or benefits. So. We will start with, um, I'm just thinking, should we show the slide? No, I think we're fine because everyone's clocked in with the menti poll, so I don't think we need to show uh, uh, the, the code again. Um, so we'll start with a discussion on what solutions um, emerged when considering the climate impact in the city of Quito um, and the particular issues there. Uh, related to things like water shortage. So um, I will, um, I'm very pleased to introduce in a minute a, a virtual speaker, uh, David ha Hakome Pollitt, um, who is currently the Metropolitan Director of Resilience at the Municipality of Quito in Ecuador and the Chief Resilience Officer as part of the Resilient Cities Network. Um, he is a systems thinker, I was delighted in those words, um, and resilience advocate with 18 years of experience in policy planning and project management. Um, and uh, David's fun fact um, relates to the fact that he has a double-barreled surname, but quite often um, people jump to the end name, so he has to be very aware of um, when his surname is used, because otherwise he can be uh, thinking that um, somebody's speaking to somebody else and it's actually him that they want. So, David, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Claire, and hi, everybody. The water, food, and health nexus affect Quito through different time and space scales, promising to perpetuate the vicious cycle that creates vulnerability among our population. Our water supply, food production, and economic systems are highly dependent on paramos or highland ecosystems. Water is our bloodline, as the Andes depend much on a healthy and functional um, Amazon rainforest to keep producing water. Although we do not, we do not foresee water stress in the near future, it is certain that in the not too distant future, competition for this resource can create energy insecurity and deepen food insecurity in Ecuador. At a local scale, everyday Quiteños and Quiteñas, the people from Quito, face difficulties with their daily routines due to a vulnerable infrastructure and an inefficient mobility system. Commutes to work or trips to access uh, food and services can be easily disrupted. This has been aggravated by climate-related events. Flooding and landslides clog, clog main arteries, where our main transportation systems operate on, on the one hand, and affect informal settlements and vulnerable populations dispersed in the city on the other. As a result, climate change in the short and in the long, in the long run is creating a larger gap for people to access food in both physical as well as in, as in economic ways. Time is, time is scarce and the scale of problems is large. In response and in the same way, solutions must be multi-solving, that is, addressing several problems at the same time. 
For example, improving housing and habitat to achieve quality and safety can be a great opportunity to reduce spatial and social gaps by improving their living conditions and also improving access to food and quality services at the same time. Uh, currently, both the development plan and the resilience strategy of Quito lays a healthy nutrition as the cornerstone that supports uh, socioeconomic inclusion. And in turn, this can help prevent the risk scenarios creation. We are um, planning and we are making, we are putting a lot of efforts into eradicating poverty and ending food insecurity to help prevent chronic illnesses and non-communicable uh, diseases. Because a sick population is prone to remain poor and is more vulnerable to climate change. While at the same time, we need to work on offering better and more inclusive alter alternatives to create and build safer, vibrant and healthier habitats in order to be better equipped to offer sustained quality of life for all. Um, I will stop there and um, thank you for the opportunity. Brilliant, thank you, David. And um, there, it was interesting when we were speaking to David because uh, we were thinking about that topic um, in, in the systems and synergy space of um, the, the, the motivations not being related to climate. So when, you know, when you're talk when you're living hand to mouth and you're facing food insecurity and things the the driver towards uh, adopting some of the systems is about being able to feed your family more healthily so we it, it is really important when we're facing um the need to adjust people's behaviors to find the trigger the emotional trigger that will um help them move towards the direction we want but it's it's not necessarily going to be relation to to climate change because there are more immediate issues. So um, now our next talk is about the interlink between the health related topic of air quality and climate. So we have um, Richa Abhadye, uh, who is head of India program for the Clean Air Fund um, and also works on campaigns across um, Clean Air Fund's geographies. Um, Reach has overseen many successful air quality campaigns, um, but has background in program development and management um, as well. So as well as working in air quality, she's developed campaigns for many relevant fields, including human rights, labor rights, women and gender equality and child protection. So uh, Richa, we now know that um, she once crossed the Sinai Desert on the back of a camel. Um, so uh, Richa, over to you, please. Thank you so much, uh, Claire. Um, air pollution is, a, is today's silent pandemic, killing millions everywhere. And along with this ongoing pandemic, the world is not acting fast enough to tackle climate change. Uh, so we have a dual problem in front of us. There are 4.2 million deaths due to impact of outdoor air pollution. And among the 4.2 million, we know that at least 300,000 children under five are losing their lives due to impact of air quality. Tackling air pollution and climate change in a joined up manner, therefore, would accelerate progress towards both cleaning up the air and making communities healthier, but also tackling the global warming and trying to reach the limits of 1.5, which would then result in saving millions of lives. In order to understand more about what an integrated approach could look like, the Clean Air Fund, in partnership with Dalberg, recently published a report which asked two following questions. One, how can we capitalize on a clean air dividend within climate action and what joined up action could really look like? And two, how incorporating air quality into climate action can make climate action cheaper, faster and fairer. Overall, we found out that incorporating clean air as a priority within climate action will accelerate progress towards climate and health goals. There is significant potential for countries to deliver effective and, in, and inclusive air quality and climate solutions to create healthier, more resilient and sustainable recovery pathways, and particularly after COVID-19. There are already some early adopters we can learn from who have started to integrate joined up action that promises early results and wide ranging support. For example, 
In 2020, Mexico stepped up its commitment to tackling both climate change and air pollution with its new national strategy to reduce short-lived climate pollutants, which would reduce black carbon emissions by 53% in 2030, which would exceed their target of NCDs in the Paris Agreement. It would also reduce total greenhouse gas emissions by 9% by 2030, primarily through methane emission reductions. Similarly, Ghana has also recognized that strategic importance of acting on air pollution and climate together. In 2020, Ghana became the first country in the world to include air pollution in the form of black carbon in the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory that was submitted to the UNFCCC. And in 2018, Ghana published a national action plan to mitigate SLCPs, which identifies measures that both improve air quality and help to mitigate against climate change. What our study found was that it's cheaper to have an integrated approach to climate and air pollution, because currently many climate decision-making processes do not account for savings on health and other co-benefits of cleaner air. Accounting for these co-benefits could unlock more CO2 abatement potential each year, and decarbonizing key sectors could therefore clean up the air and help, and help to slow down warming. Secondly, we found out that joined up action creates faster results on reducing both global warming and air pollution. Solutions that deliver climate and air quality co-benefits can save and improve millions of lives and grow economies within a typical political term. The faster results of air pollution benefits contribute significantly to the case for climate investments. And lastly, integrated action is also fairer because it will benefit the poor and the most vulnerable who currently suffer the most. Poor and the most vulnerable are the most exposed to air pollution with little agency to mitigate or adapt to, their health, to the health impacts. Similarly, the poor and the most vulnerable are also who face the brunt of climate change. These communities are at the front lines of both, of both climate and air pollution. So the faster we put in solutions, the faster the, the vulnerable uh, will have a chance to survive. So what do we do? If we end the, use, end the use of fossil fuels, which contribute to both air pollution and climate change, we accelerate the gains on both fronts. People and communities get healthier, they breathe cleaner air, babies will not be born with stunted growth, children will not grow up with lifelong diseases as a result of toxic air. Ending the use of fossil fuels will significantly slow down global warming and bring us closer to the 1.5 degree target. However, there's just one caveat. Ending any new fossil fuel exploration and investment needs to happen now, not a year later, not two years later, and certainly not 10 years later. At the end, what we found was rolling out solutions to air pollution helps us to make communities healthier today, giving policymakers and pol uh, political capital to act on bolder steps to decarbonize sectors that both pol pollute the air as well as cause global warming. We found out that politicians and political policymakers can rely on solutions to clean air to take much bolder steps for the future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Richa. And thank you for bringing in the, the aspect of climate justice and for communicating that um, it's cheaper to have integrated uh, approach. Um, so two final speakers, um, they will be sharing their passion for the benefits of nature-based solutions on both climate and health. Um, so first off, we have Amanda Sturgeon. She is uh, the head of Re regenerative design at Mott McDonald. Um, she's a, an award-winning architect um, and globally recognized leader in regenerative and biophilic design. Um, uh, so Amanda, you're gonna have to tell us your fun fact um, uh, and hopefully you're a little prepared, but otherwise just make one up. Um, over to you, Amanda. Hi everybody and good evening here from um, Sydney, Australia, where I'm speaking to you from Gadigal land and I first want to acknowledge that um, I'm speaking to you from land that was never ceded and has always been and will always be Aboriginal land and I want to pay my respects for elders past, present and the future and uh, I, will, I will feed into my presentation about regenerative design about um, you know how the Aboriginal uh, philosophy of taking care of country and it will take care of us is a relevant solution for us to address both climate and health at the same time. And maybe a fun fact, Claire, is that I'm, um, it's currently, let me see, 1.30 in the morning here in Sydney. 
So um, miraculously, I'm awake and, and somewhat eloquent, hopefully, in, in my presentation to you. Um, I have to confess, I did take a little bit of an earlier nap so that I could, I could be awake and, um, and coherent. But um, I'm going to talk about how I'm bringing a regenerative design approach to large transportation projects and city shaping projects. So um, you may not know that Sydney is in a, in a vast phase of, of massive growth. Um, it's looking to um, grow by several million people uh, in the next decade or two. And to, and to address that, um, thankfully, active and um, public transportation systems are, are being rapidly uh, developed and, and built. But, um, you know, and those are being built both in sort of current greenfield areas that will be uh, future parts of Sydney, as well as in the dense urban areas of Sydney and everything in between. Um, so what I am doing currently is bringing a regenerative design approach to those projects. Uh, so what is it, firstly, um, and why is it important for bringing together both climate and health? So regenerative design seeks to harmonize the relationships between nature and people through the projects that we design. It uses a whole systems approach that focuses on regenerating natural systems to create positive outcomes for both people and nature at the same time. So typically our projects, right, they focus on people, especially when we look at you know, public transportation systems. We're focused on how many people we can move. We're focused on the ticketing process being efficient, we're focusing on, you know, the, the system being safe. Um, there's a lot of people focused outcomes that we tend to focus on in our transportation projects. Um, but, you know, what we miss in that uh, approach is that, you know, we miss we just focus on what's good for people. Um, we ultimately, uh, you know, have, have really sort of negative outcomes on all other species that we share this planet with. And we miss also that if we don't support and allow those natural systems and ecosystems and other species to thrive, that we're gonna be dealing with a massive biodiversity collapse um, that will result in negative health impacts for every person on the planet. So with the collapse that we're, that we're facing, I am working on pivoting our focus to both positive outcomes for people, as we've heard so many brilliant ideas already in this session, but also that we pair those with positive impacts for all other species as well. Um, in some of the projects that I'm working on, we're dealing with dense urban areas. And it's not uncommon for me to hear from colleagues and, you know, and on the client side that, well, the rivers have been polluted over, you know, the last uh, couple of hundred years. The ecosystems have been destroyed. The ecology is really composed of like mono species imported from the UK. And the ecology kind of, you know, is composed of, you know, rats and cockroaches predominantly. So, you know, what I, what I commonly hear is this, this, there's nothing here, that, um, you know, there's no na natural system. But those are the kinds of areas that are primary generation. And for us to, to think about what keystone species we might be able to regenerate in our dense urban areas. So, so what if we were to be able to design for species that we want to regenerate uh, through our transportation systems and allow those systems to unlock um, a whole regeneration of um, nature systems, river systems, and, um, and systems that can support all kinds of life as well as people. Um, what the outcome we would achieve would be that we could create thriving river systems with with native parklands that are teeming with uh, insect and bird life that lo and behold are also incredibly positive for our communities and our people that help to contribute towards bringing clean air, clean water, as well as the intersection with nature in what is typically uh, areas of cities that are really nature devoid. I call them um, nature deserts. And we could um, have both positive impacts for people and nature with really very very little impact on the bottom line of a project um, and look sort of beyond just the people outcomes um, to uh, all other outcomes for all other species. So regenerative design is bringing this frame of mind to a project. Um, it's saying we cannot have wellness and health of people without having wellness and health of all natural systems on which we rely. And um, it's it's been, uh, really sort of heartening to see when we bring this perspective to projects, how many 
uh, people that are engaged with projects at this scale resonate with those kinds of solutions and that kind of approach. Um, I started with, you know, an indigenous acknowledgement, uh, which is typical uh, sort of, you know, conduct uh, at the beginning of meetings and presentations in Australia uh, fairly recently. Um, but I do want to come back to uh, an Aboriginal saying. So Aboriginal people in Australia refer to nature or to um, the, the place that they're from as country um, with a capital C, uh, quite a different sort of thing, definition to what we think of in the terms of country in the UK. Um, and the saying that if we take care of country, it will take care of us is, um, you know, really predominant, not just in uh, Aboriginal communities, but in Indigenous countries around the world, who have recognised that we really can't have a healthy, uh, healthy people without really respecting and taking care of the place and understanding that place and, and being an active part of regenerating and supporting its health and allowing it to thrive. So, um, you know, I think if we look back at our Indigenous communities and um, look to what they can bring us in the present and into the future, we will see a lot of the solutions that we may need uh, for the future for us to address both climate and health uh, at the same time. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, thank you for uh, reminding us of the importance of having respect for nature which uh, is uh, a great introduction to our last spe speaker, Jad Daly, um, who is um, the CEO and president of um, American Forests. Leads, uh, Jad leads its strategic direction um, and serves as its chief en engagement officer as well in building diverse partnerships to advance American Forests' mission. Um, you, you have a list of... Um, uh, uh, of uh, initiatives that you're part of, which I'm not going to go into because there are so many of them, so I will jump straight on to the fact that we know you're passionate about wood um, and your favourite product is the mandolin, um, which uh, you play every weekend in a bluegrass band. That's exactly right. Um, wood has many magical qualities and I think music is one of the most remarkable of them. Okay, so uh, I'm the last speaker on one of the last panels of a very long two weeks, um, so I know it's a bit of a challenge. Um, so um, I, I, what I want to do, as opposed to cramming a bunch more information uh, in, into everyone's heads at this point, is to try to make a couple of high-level connections between things that we've heard here today. Um, and instead of slides, I'm actually going to give you permission to multitask. So close out of Twitter, because uh, I know that's where you are, um, and, and actually just open a browser and, and go to treeequityscore.org. Treeequityscore, it's all, all you know, kind of words mashed together, .org. And that's going to take you to an online tool that our organization created that will um, explain, uh, it will connect a lot of the, the things that I, I want to I wanna say. Um, and hopefully it's something that you can play with. We feel free to play with it while we're talking, and I hope you, that you'll play with it when you go home. Okay, so point number one. Uh, I really appreciate Irvine's point about mitigation and adaptation. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I think Cities Day should have been the first day. How is it that we're talking about the place where most people live on the last day? Uh, that feels wrong. Um, and quite frankly, that's the way it usually goes down. That's not a coincidence, right? Uh, cities have kind of been at the, the tail end of the climate action uh, attention span here for a long time. And I think in part it is because, to your point, Irvine, we don't think about it the right way. You know, and we balkanize it. And we think about, oh, how do we protect cities from flooding? Uh, or how do we protect cities from heat? And that's a resilience thing. When is the point I'm going to make is trees, for example, are something that actually is a potent form of mitigation and adaptation. And we can do both of those things together. And in fact, there are lots and lots of the things that we need to do in cities for adaptation and resilience that are, are much more of a mitigation solution than people realize. So I think that's one thing I want to leave everyone. We need to take on as an obligation in this community of folks who care about adaptation and resilience to always characterize the mitigation benefits. A number of years ago, I actually worked on uh, helping to create a new greenhouse gas uh, funded pro a, a program funded out of greenhouse gas proceeds in the state of California. Um, and the way we were able to do that was called an urban green, it's called, the program's called urban greening. 
And one of the ways that we were able to do that is that we did an inventory of what the greenhouse gas benefits were going to be from all of these different uh, interventions, uh, green infrastructure interventions, and found all sorts of efficiencies that people hadn't understood. Um, and so when we were able to show that mitigation and adaptation connection together, we unlocked $80 million of carbon proceeds because they had to be tied to something that could produce a mitigation benefit. But I think, quite frankly, we also made the work uh, much more interesting to a broader range of actors in the climate community. So here's your point number one. Uh, we are actually doing mitigation and adaptation, and let's own it, let's characterize it, and let's drive it forward. And that tool that I asked you to open up, treeequityscore.org, we quantify the climate mitigation benefits of more tree cover uh, in cities. Okay, point number two. Why is it called tree equity score? Um, very important. A map of trees, and we heard this throughout the other speakers, there's another through line between the things that you've heard today. All around the world, and acutely in the United States, a map of tree cover is a map of income and it is a map of race and ethnicity in ways that transcend income. So that data that you're holding there in your hand, true equity score, it shows that on average in the United States, our lowest income communities have 41% less tree cover than our wealthiest communities. Our communities of color, regardless of income, due to structural and systemic racism like the practice of redlining, have 33% less tree cover. Now, why does that matter? Tree cover is our number one, as you've heard all day, it's our number one defense against extreme heat, which is the greatest public health threat from climate change. It's also a potent defense against air pollution. Of course, heat and air pollution, I think everyone here knows, work together and are rising together as a result of climate change. So trees are our number one nature-based intervention for climate justice, for health equity and climate justice in this horrific context that we've created uh, with climate change. And so the irony is the people who most need their homes to be cooled by trees, people who might not have air, air conditioning, don't have heat resilient homes, are the ones who are least likely to have that protection. The folks who have are more likely to have respiratory illness as a pre-existing condition are having that exacerbated because they have worse air uh, quality in their community, in part because they don't have adequate tree cover. So what we did with Tree Equity Score is we didn't just generally announce that and just, we didn't generalize it. We mapped every urban neighborhood in America. You can enter the name of a city uh, for any city in America and take it all the way down to the neighborhood level and see neighborhood by neighborhood where the lack of trees is most acutely killing and sickening people um, because you have a lack of trees and it's being compounded by these risk factors uh, that, that I've described. And so uh, naming it and framing it like that um, has really changed the conversation and translating that data all the way down to the local level. And here's just, I've, I've got a million statistics I could share, but I'll just, do, I'll just share one. In the United States right now, 12,000 people per year die from extreme heat. The projection is, this is a Duke University study, the projection is this century, 100,000 people per year, an almost tenfold increase, are going to die from extreme heat. And newsflash, we heard it from Sophie, we heard it from other people, that's not going to happen in leafy neighborhoods. That's going to happen in lower income communities and communities of color, again, where people have these underlying risk factors in their homes, in their health care, uh, and where a little extra stress from extreme heat uh, is going to be the tipping point of putting more people into uh, illness and death. So this is, that's why we say this is not an environmental campaign, this is a moral imperative. Not having trees in your neighborhood is like not having stoplights or sewers. It's basic infrastructure, not scenery. It's basic health and safety infrastructure for a just society. And by the way, it's also a climate solution at the same time. If we, if we can't do that, shame on us. Absolutely shame on us. Um, and so uh, now I want to get to the, so if I hopefully have sold you on the, you've heard a lot about trees today, but I want to put some numbers around it. I want to really make sure everybody understands just how common a consistent an issue this is around the, the, the world, the, the profound impacts that it has, uh, and, and therefore we have the imperative to do something about it. Well, so uh, Claire, I'm going to close by, by saying how we in the U.S. have been building a movement that, by the way, ties into not just being aided by the policies that we heard, kinds of policies we heard about earlier today, but actually has become a driver of creating them. And here's the first thing. Tree equity score has influenced policy. We have $500 million for tree equity that was part of the infrastructure bill that passed last weekend in the U.S. Congress. We have another $2.8 billion 2.8 billion dollars in the Build Back Better Act for tree equity. The U.S. government right now spends 30 million dollars a year on this purpose. We're talking about a more than tenfold increase in the amount of money that the U.S. government would spend on this every year. Well, how did that happen? 
Well, one way it happened is that instead of talking about it one city at a time, we showed with True Equity Score, we showed that it, uh, how universal it was. And we actually used data to show how the, the scale of impact that we were having and to show that if you give us the money, we know what to do. We, we, can, we can have data-driven investment uh, in, our, in our neighborhoods, in our, in our communities, if you give us the money. And, and that has been a huge factor in getting this incredible uh, federal uh, investment. Second thing, and I should say, the last thing I'll say about that I think that's really important is that you're all sitting there using it right now, and I don't think anyone here has a degree in computer science, most likely. So we made a really important decision, not just to create the data and not just create the tool, but make it as easy, easy to use as a smartphone. So that every citizen, every citizen's group, every mayor uh, and, and every White House official, we're all seeing the same information and can all work with the same information uh, together. And that, 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 so it's not just the information, the way we've mobilized it, I think is really, really important. And I think we all need to be thinking about data and tools in that way. Okay, second, we have to build the right kind of partnerships. So uh, earlier today I was with, uh, virtually, with the, uh, the mayor of Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Mayor Kate Gallego. Arizona, fifth largest city in the United States committed this spring um, through the mayor and the city council that, to achieve tree equity in every neighborhood by 2030. Go search Phoenix and you'll see there's a lot of work to do. That's a big commitment that the city of Phoenix has made. Well, how do they make that commitment? Well, one part of it was we, show, we showed the need with the data. The second thing, though, was we spent a year before that commitment, spent actually a little more than a year, pulling together over 50 organizations from the most local uh, community-based groups, frontline organizations, all the way to the, to the mayor's office, all spending a year talking about what's this problem that we're dealing with, how would we fix it, what's everyone's role, so that it didn't just, that idea didn't just land in the city uh, as some top-down thing. It, it grew up from this Phoenix Urban Forest Roundtable. So we need to build the right kinds of partnerships so that by the time we're making policy, it's effortless for policymakers. They know we're all behind them, and that's going to be a really important piece of the puzzle. The third thing is, no one wants to invest in something if you're not quite sure if it's going to work. In urban forestry, a lot of folks have raised questions. Do we know how to plant the right trees in the right places? Will we have unintended consequences if we plant, tr plant trees? Will they all fall on someone's house? Um, and so uh, we invested with the U.S. Forest Service in, in the U.S., our organization, and the U.S. Forest Service created a new Urban Forest and Health Action Guide where we answered all those very specific questions about what tree species uh, to plant, how to plant them, where taking into account climate resilience and adaptation, climate mitigation so we can maximize that, that climate mitigation benefit, and all the variables of how trees can benefit health. So we're really being fine scale and precise in getting all the air quality benefits, heat risk reduction benefits, and other health benefits uh, that trees can provide. So we, we really showed that we, we know what we're doing here. We're going to have the right technique and rigor um, to how we do it. And that has all led to, again, the kinds of ultimately big policy solutions, big investments uh, that we're getting. And so now, we didn't just get all dressed up with nowhere to go, but we actually have city by city around, around America, uh, folks who are ready to do this work at scale, and lastly, matched by incredible state, local, and private investment. I want to I just, uh, my last uh, plug is if you want to see what that looks like, check out um, us.1t.org. Uh, we formed a coalition in the U.S. of all the different state and local governments, companies, NGOs, uh, and civil society organizations, youth and faith organizations, all of whom were interested in this issue. And we said, okay, everybody say what you're willing to do to help us move it forward so that, again, when we're doing things like trying to get massive new federal funding, we can show that everyone's in. And what, you see, what you'll see there, if you go to us.1t.org, is an incredible wave of pledges from everyone from literally the Girl Scouts of the USA um, to state and local governments uh, that have gone all in and they put themselves down for what they're going to do to try to achieve tree equity in cities and also use uh, forests as a climate solution uh, outside of cities. So I think, Claire, if we take that kind of an approach, we're structured, we're data-driven, we're holistic, we're rigorous in everything that we're doing and ultimately make it into an us thing where there's a role for everyone, uh, we can do huge things and we can, for, among other things, deliver tree equity. Brilliant, thank you. And, and I could see our time to look at the, the results of the, the Mentimeter poll reducing, but you are so compelling, so definitely needed uh, for you to keep telling your, you, uh, us your messages, including the fact that quantification is the thing that, that then unlocks the funding because you were able to quantify these benefits across different angles. So 
Um, I, I think what we'll do, I wanted to sort of finish on the message of let's keep talking, but I am fascinated to know what's come out of the, the, the poll. So if we can uh, bring those up and we'll just flick through them, probably not time for, for comments on them, except um, some thoughts that I might have. So um, choose three interventions you think will most benefit both climate resilience and societal health. So um, the strong three are improving air quality, promoting active lifestyles, and promoting sustainable uh, food production and nutrition. Um, so I, for me, that's not a great surprise, except perhaps the, the, the low one on the right, the um, protection against flooding. Um, so that is quite interesting. Sorry? Um, okay, let's go on to the next one. I'm quite interested to know uh, what's coming out of the next one. The top three barriers uh, to having a more integrated approach to climate change and health. Uh, so leadership and governance, I guess that's not a surprise, um, but uh, hopefully Sophie uh, and a few of the other speakers have, have injected some enthusiasm there. Disciplinary silos, again, very much not a surprise and something that possibly we can do something about. Um, and um, uh, uh, complexity and awareness, those are things, again, that um, I'm not surprised. Um, okay, what have we next? The next question is more about um, trying to filter whether, oh, we're neck and neck on that, um, whether um, are the policy driven, so the first four speakers, five speakers, or um, topic driven, our second set, are um, more likely to be effective. And obviously it's a combination of both, but I was interested to know whether there would be a front runner. So I am most interested to know what comes up on the final slide, um, which is a word cloud. Um, could interesting so one word to describe the relationship between health and climate resilience interconnected that's good that does show that we need to increase the um, or break down the barriers between departmental silos symbiotic intertwined critical and crucial um, which I think all of which are very relevant so just on our final slide the reason we put this together was to be sharing messages so um, let's keep talking. There, uh, you can find our speakers, uh, most of them on LinkedIn. I was really glad to find that you'd made a connection with um, with Sophie Irvin. So hopefully you can keep that going. Um, and uh, the information you can find more information um, under uh, the Resilience Hub Health and Wellbeing topic um, with some links to some. Uh, some reports and things that our speakers have talked about because that's what this is. This is about collaboration, sharing messages uh, across different sides of the world and then moving forwards together. So thank you everybody for listening. Thank you to everyone participating online for the work that you did on the polls. So thank you very much. And to uh, our speakers online and Jad here in the room. Thank you.